Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one about the time St. Thomas Aquinas went dark. It happened on the 6th of December, 1273. It was a Wednesday. It was the Feast of St. Nicholas. St. Thomas Aquinas was celebrating his daily Mass when something occurred, something happened to him. Because after the Mass was finished, he let it be known that he was through writing as his amanuensis, his scribe, Reginald of Perpino, was later to report, Thomas said, everything I have written up to this point has been but of straw. And for the rest of his life, he died almost exactly three months later, Thomas Aquinas stopped writing in spite of the fact that Reginald tried to encourage him to take up the pen again on more than one occasion. Reginald was so struck by this strange and sudden ceasing of writing that he remembered it the rest of his life and told the story on his deathbed some three decades later. And there's reason why Reginald was so astounded, because Thomas Aquinas was one of the most prolific authors not only of his generation, but of any generation. It is estimated that during his lifetime of writing, which encompassed about a quarter of a century, Thomas wrote over eight and a half million words. Moreover, he stopped writing just as he was about to conclude his magnum opus, the magisterial uh, Summa Theologiae. He was seven-eighths of the way through it, and yet he laid down his pen before finishing it. Now, I suppose that there's some irony in the fact that this author of eight and a half million words, many of them about theology and God, ultimately believed that we can know very little about the God that he worshipped and the God about whom he tried to express ideas. God, according to St. Thomas, is ultimately incomprehensible, and we are deceiving ourselves if we think otherwise. Oh, there are certain glimmers that break through the clouds. There's no doubt about that. For example, with our empirical senses, when we examine the world, we can discern footprints or traces of God in it. And the reason for that is that the effects point back to their cause. That's what the famous quinque lie, the famous five demonstrations for the uh, existence of God that you find at the beginning of the Summa Theologiae are based upon. But Thomas was never uh, um, foolish enough to presume that that kind of tracing back from the footprints of God gives us more than a rather abstract understanding that there must be something uh, in existence which we can call God who is the first cause of everything that is. Put it a slightly different way, the transcendence of God will always outstrip the traces of God we discover empirically in the world, and therefore God will remain incomprehensible to us from an empirical perspective. But from an intellectual perspective, God likewise remains incomprehensible, because God is infinite, God is eternal, and our minds are finite and temporal. There is no way we can possibly hope to absorb the grandeur, the holiness, the transcendence, the infinity and eternity of God. Even when God reveals to us information about God's nature, such as, for example, the Trinity, it will always remain ultimately a mystery to us. We cannot comprehend it. And by comprehend now, what I mean is what Thomas would have meant, the Latin, um, that is, our minds are incapable of circling around and absorbing um, revelations such as Trinity, much less the transcendence of God, God's self. In other words, Thomas has been very influenced by what has come to be known as negative theology, the apophatic tradition in theology, which kind of gets its start with an earlier theologian whom we simply call the pseudo-Dionysus because we don't know who he actually was. And in a book that he wrote about negative theology, what the pseudo-Dionysus argues is that, again, because of the transcendence of God, we will never be able to say anything positive about God. The best we can do is to say God is not this, and God is not this, and God is not that. 
Thomas is a little more optimistic about being able to say some positive things about God, even though we may not comprehend them fully. But he is still, nonetheless, very influenced by negative theology. And if I may, let me just read you a few passages from his works that really um, point out just how influenced by negative theology Thomas actually was. So, for instance, at the beginning of the Summa Theologiae, when he is asking whether or not God is simple, he writes this, Because we cannot know what God is, but rather what he is not, we have no means for considering how God is, but rather how he is not. Or consider this passage from an earlier work by Thomas. It's his commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard. Any scholastic of Thomas's generation um, basically had to write commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard. Uh, it was just expected and required, and Thomas wrote his. And this is what he says at one point in that commentary. We know God most perfectly in the present life when we realize him to be above all that our intellect can conceive, and thus we are joined to him as to one unknown. It's astounding, isn't it? Or finally, what about this particular passage? It comes from one of Thomas's commentaries on a treatise on the Trinity written by the Roman philosopher Boethius. Thomas writes, We know God most of all as the unknown, because the mind is found to know God most perfectly, when it is known that his essence is above everything it can apprehend in this life. So Thomas is convinced that God is incomprehensible, that ultimately God is unknowable this side of the grave, and perhaps in God's essence, even on the other side of the grave. Now, let's go back to the day in which St. Thomas went dark, the day in which St. Thomas fell silent and no longer wrote about God. What happens there? What happens there? Well, it seems to me that commentators have uh, frequently uh, argued that there are three possibilities. One is that St. Thomas suffered some kind of a stroke during his celebration of Mass. A second possibility is that his intense labor over the past quarter century simply caught up with him and he suffered a physical and emotional breakdown. And the third possibility is that while he was celebrating Mass, he actually experienced a mystical vision. He was vouchsafed a glimpse of the God whom he had been struggling to write about lo those many years. It seems to me that these three possibilities, by the way, are not incompatible. God frequently uses our weaknesses when our defenses are down to reveal God's self to us. For my money, though, it seems to me to be most reasonable to presume that Thomas did have a mystical experience, that he caught a glimpse of that which most of us do not catch glimpses of. He caught a glimpse of the glory of God, of the supreme, mysterious light of the Godhead, and that's what convinced him that everything that he had written up to that point was but of straw. And keep in mind, he was already primed for that kind of a revelation because of his fidelity to negative theology, his humble realization that everything that he had been writing about God was already inadequate, already fell short of the mark. And here, during this experience at Mass, he realizes finally just how short of the mark it did fall. Two other things I think ought to be said about why Thomas went dark. The first is this. His going dark, his refusing to write anymore after he's had this glorious vision of the fullness, the plenitude of God, is a marker of his humility, isn't it? If there was ever a humble theologian who walked the earth, it was Thomas Aquinas. You will see no trace of his personality in his writings. He totally puts himself in the background and what comes to the fore are his reflections about God, reflections about God which he earnestly hopes shed some light for us in our own faith journeys. That's the first thing, it seems to me, worth taking into consideration. And the second is this. Brian Davies, who is a wonderful Thomistic scholar, in a recent book called Thomas Aquinas, A Portrait, says this. 
He says, all good theology begins in silence and it ends in silence. And I believe that what Davies is getting at is this. All good theology begins with an awareness of the mystery of God, with the inexplicability and the incomprehensibility of God, and uses that awareness in a mindful and prayerful and rational way to try to say whatever can be said about God. This is good theology, theology that, as our Orthodox sisters and brothers would say, is done on one's knees. But ultimately, what began in silence must end in silence. What began with an appreciation of mystery must end with a continuing appreciation of mystery. The humble realization that whatever we say about God is going to be incomplete, is going to be ambiguous, is going to be metaphorical or symbolic, is going to fall short of the reality, just as the footprints of God in the physical world fall short of the transcendent creator who left them there. And I suspect that that's what Thomas Aquinas ultimately realized during that fateful mass, that the mystery which he had been dealing with for 25, uh, 25 years, that the mystery which he had been in love with for 25 years simply would always outstrip anything that he could have possibly said about it. And in that moment, the caliber of the man comes through. The true sanctity of Thomas Aquinas comes through, doesn't it? Because honesty and devotion led him to forsake a project that he must have been so totally personally invested in in order to enter ever more deeply, ever more silently, ever more darkly into the mystery of the deity. I think there's a great lesson for us here, my friends. We should never renounce our rational abilities. They're God-given, and they're God-given for us to use, not only for the exploration of the world, but for God's greater good. But we should never forget that underneath the reason, underneath all of our words, underneath all of our theologizing and our speculating, shimmers that divine mystery. And that even though we may not go totally dark as St. Thomas Aquinas did after his mystical experience, there are times in our lives when we would do well to darken our intellects, to silence our words, and to simply sit in the presence of that glorious, glorious mystery, which we call God. I'm Father Kerry Walters, and this has been another Holy Spirit moment. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, if you would like, I invite you to consider subscribing to the Holy Spirit Moments YouTube channel. So my friends, please wear your masks and keep socially distanced, not only for your safety, but for the well-being of others. God bless you. I will see you soon.